Good evening all. Today we will be discussing about sickle cell uh, disease and its anesthetic consideration. So uh, what uh, the topic which was given to me is sickle cell anemia. But uh, sickle cell anemia is uh, uh, an entity in a broader spectrum called sickle cell disease. So sickle cell disease itself is an autosomal recessive disorder which is present in millions worldwide and it was noted in 1902 or 1910 with the pulmonary crisis. And it has got a very multi-organ involvement because it is basically involving the hemoglobin and the blood per se. So sickle cell disease is can be homozygous or heterozygous. One of the sickle cell disease is sickle cell anemia and the other is sickle cell beta thalassemia. And all these sickle cells can actually vary uh, depending upon the inheritance. May it be the sickle cell disease type. If it's a sickle cell anemia, if it is homozygous, the HPS level is 80 to 95 percentage and the fetal hemoglobin is 5 to 15 percentage. And in the sickle cell C disease, the HPS percentage, the sickling HP percentage is 50 to 55 and HPC percentage is 40 to 45. And there is a uh, separate entity as sickle cell beta thalassemia. It can be either homozygous or heterozygous. And there are other variants like Arab variant, Asian variant and all that. And the African variant is associated with much more severity. So why are we talking about sickle cell anemia in retailers? It is basically the disease of hemoglobin. So what is hemoglobin? It is a tetrahedral globular structure, which is the metalloprotein with the quaternary ring. So it basically has got two components. One is the heme component, another is the globin component. The globin component has two chains. One is an alpha chain, which again has two alpha chains, which is alpha 1 and alpha 2. And beta has beta 1 and beta 2. And these four globin chains are per se related to each heme molecules. And this together encompasses the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin basically is heme plus globin. And so what is the causative mutation which causes this uh, sickle cell anemia is? It can be either homozygous or heterozygous wherein the patient can be a trite as well. So what happens is uh, the GTG amino acid is substituted for GAG in the sixth codon of the beta globin chain in chromosome 11. What happens is there is a hydrophilic glutamic acid residue which is replaced by the valine acid residues at the sixth position of the beta chain. So this mutated hemoglobin of HBS is what is causing the sickle cell anemia. And what is the primary pathophysiology of this is it has got four uh, components or four pathophysiological process wherein the first one is the hemoglobin polymerization the hemoglobin s polymerization the second thing is vaso occlusion following the hemoglobin s polymerization and hemolysis mediated endothelial dysfunction and the last one is the sterile inflammation so what causes this hemoglobin s polymerization is the hemoglobin itself the hemoglobin s itself it has got an inherent instability and it exposes the erythrocyte membrane to the oxidant damage of iron as well as free oxygen molecules, maybe superoxide ion or an O2 ion. So under normal circumstances, what happens is the dangers of oxygen as well as iron is nullified by the structure of hemoglobin, wherein the iron containing moiety, as you have seen in the hemoglobin structure, this iron containing moiety is actually encompassed by the hydrophilic glutamic acid residues and this heme entity is not actually exposed to external solutes which will precipitate a hemoglobin polymerization. So what happens in sickle cell anemia is this sickling cell, this is polymerized and it becomes insoluble and it exposes the exposure of hydrophobic molecules against the RBCs. So there is nucleation of deoxyhemoglobin. What would normally be as so what would normally be as healthy RBCs, what happens is because of long thinning polymers of the hemoglobin in the sickling cell, this polymerizes and it causes increased cellular rigidity and also distortion of the erythrocyte membrane. As you can see, it is actually highly malleable it will move across any vessels but this sickle cell it will get occluded with one another and it will form long polymer strands and it will cause vaso occlusion so what happens because of this impaired rheology is totally the cellular energy gets failure and there is a stress across the rbcs and that will lead to dehydration and premature hemolysis and 
the second phenomenon is vaso occlusive crisis this vaso occlusive crisis is a inter, uh, intricate pathophysiological process which is solely attributed to sickle cell disease which is caused by leukocyte adhesion platelet activation and adhesion and coagulation and as well as vaso constriction what is the basic pathology is there is an impaired rheology rheology is actually characterized or attributed by viscosity hematocrit and erythrocyte deformity as in sickle cell anemia because of recurrent uh, blood transfusion as well as hemolysis there is increased viscosity of the blood and at times because of uh, lysis it can be the hematocrit can be low and erythrocyte deformability will be less in case of sickle cell anemia and uh, in sickle cell anemia there is increased expression of adhesion molecules on the surface of sickle rbcs and binding moieties like the rbcs will get binded to one another and all reticulocytes which are coming from the bone marrow of these patients have also got these adhesion molecules and these adhesion molecules will tend to bind with one rbc to another leukocyte to one another and platelet to one another and hence occlude the vessel and cause the vaso occlusive crisis this vaso occlusive crisis is also due to chronic hemolysis which will increase the viscosity and also mechanical sequestration of the deformed rbcs by the spleen and the third pathophysiological process is the endothelial dysfunction so what is the primary pathophysiology behind this endothelial dysfunction is whatever hemolysis which is occurring there is increased fraction of free hemoglobin in the blood so this free hemoglobin will actually bind with the nitric oxide nitric oxide is an intrinsic vasodilator as everybody has known this intrinsic vasodilatory property of nitric oxide is lost this nitric oxide will react with hemoglobin and form hemonitrosyl compounds and the total pathophysiology of how nitric oxide is inducing this endothelial dysfunction is not well completely understood and the uh, this nitric oxide also converts the iron to the ferric state and binding of further hemoglobin molecules to oxygen is also affected and the last but not the least pathophysiology is a sterile inflammation which happens because of ischemic reperfusion injury as well as the heme molecules the free hemoglobin which is present in the blood will also incite a sterile inflammatory response by interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 18 whereas it will release the inflammasome activation and it will lead to sterile inflammation all across the blood vessels in this patient and this chronic endothelial dysfunction will always have its impact on each and every organ in the heart what happens is because of occlusion of all small pulmonary vessels all small pulmonary vessels these will impact a back pressure on the right ventricle when the right ventricle is experiencing lot of back pressure over a period of time pulmonary hypertension will develop and the right heart will fail and it can lead to pulmonary artery hypertension as in men this left heart is actually meeting up with anemia and over a period of time in order to increase the cardiac output what happens is this left ventricle starts to overwork and over a period of time it will lead to either systolic failure or diastolic failure and so this vaso occlusion which is the basic pathophysiology in the vaso occlusive crisis or acute chest syndrome is actually characterized by chronic intravascular hemolysis increased cell free hemoglobin chronic vascular stiffness and that by it leads to end organ damage so what are all the end organ involvement you are looking at when you are seeing a patient of sickle cell anemia in the pre op what all you should look at so in the cardiovascular system if you happen to see a patient since because the patient is anemic from childhood the heart will tend to compensate for it by increasing the cardiac output so thereby all the lv will overwork and lead to lv wall stress that in turn can land up in hypertension and because of lv wall stress it will lead to elevated pulse pressures the diastolic pressure will be normal but the systolic pressures will be overheld because to compensate for the anemia which is present at the tissue level so there can be an elevated pulse pressure when there is a prolonged increase in wall stress the relaxation property of the lv is lost and it leads to diastolic failure so when you are looking at a patient in a pre op always have a look at the ecg and echocardiogram